Hi, everybody. Welcome to Trial Alchemy. And today I've got as my guest, Bob Jeske, and he is a great trial lawyer here in San Diego, California. He is a lawyer who's tried mostly uh, cases on the side of the defense, but he's also tried plaintiff's cases. And his emphasis is, involves premises liability, product liability, personal injury litigation, including catastrophic injury claims on behalf of plaintiffs and defendants. And he's handled all kinds of cases, complex real property, business disputes, legal malpractice on the defense side, malicious prosecution and claims under the ADA, Americans with Disabilities Act. And uh, he's been retained in cases for and against multinational insurance companies. And he represents major commercial and retail centers in ongoing litigation. Bob's been a member of the San Diego chapter of Aboda for a number of years. And he is somebody who is recognized in best lawyers in America. He's also been for many years in super lawyers and in the corporate council edition of super lawyers. And Bob has also uh, been awarded what I believe is probably the highest honor you can get as a San Diego attorney. And that is he's been the, given the Daniel T. Broderick III award. Uh, and that's given to somebody who's not only an outstanding trial lawyer, but somebody who is recognized for their civility and the fact that their word is their bond. So without any further ado, glad to have you with us here, Bob, and welcome and thanks for joining me in this discussion today. Thanks, Monty. I appreciate your asking. I look forward to the discussion. I really think uh, I love your podcast. I've seen others and uh, I think this is just a gem. So I appreciate being here. Well, thanks. Thanks so very much. Let's start out with this question, and that is, um, tell us about one of your most satisfying trial victories. Well, I think it's interesting. I would say that my most satisfying trial victory is probably because it followed my most humbling and humiliating trial defeat. Um, I had uh, circumstances, probably coming up on 10 years ago now, where I got my ever loving tail kicked in a case uh, and it rocked me. I mean, it, it truly, truly rocked me. And I, and I suppose as trial lawyers, we're not supposed to say that, you know, we're supposed to be immune from that kind of stuff and we're supposed to be able to take them as they come. Well, I didn't. And, and it, it, uh, it hurt, you know, and it made me wonder, am I doing this the right way? And do I have it in me mm -hmm. to do this? And am I, is anybody ever going to believe me again? And, uh, you know, all of those, uh, those doubts that were then uh, punctuated by the fact that I got absolutely thumped. And so the next, the next case was hard, real hard, because mm -hmm. it was a hard case anyway, but uh, it was hard getting back up on the horse and, you know, fear creeps in, doubt creeps in, uh, anxiety creeps in. And so the fact that that case turned out well, and I happened to win that case, uh, not only because it was an important case and there was a lot on the line, but, but it was, uh, slaying a demon because I, I really was, uh, I was rocked by the one that I lost and we all lose them. I think, I think that's true. I think everybody loses cases, whether they want to admit it or not. And, and I'm not too proud to admit it hurts when I lose. So. Well, I, I thank you for sharing that. It hurts for all of us, Bob. I mean, you want to do your job. I think you get more invested as you get prepared for the trial and you really believe your client should win. And it's really knocks you down when, when the jury says, nope, we believe the other side and they go the other way. So thanks for being willing to share that. Now, let's let's follow that a little bit. You know, with all trial lawyers, and I agree with you, you're going to lose cases. If you try cases, you're going to lose. No doubt. Um, maybe if you never try a case or you only tried one, you might say, hey, I've got an unblemished record. Right. Right. <laughs> right. But, but somebody who's really a trial lawyer, you're going to lose. And hopefully it's you're going to win most of the time. Uh, but it's going to happen. So have you, when you've gone through your life, as a trial lawyer, and you've been practicing law a number of years now. Don't you learn more when things go bad and you have a defeat? 
Oh, without question, without question. Like, like, did you learn any lessons from that case? And I'm throwing this out at you, but did you learn any lessons? You said, you know, looking back, you go, you know, that's helped me, even though it was hard as hell to go through it. There's no question. I, I think that, I mean, in, in terms of that case, it was one where uh, I got into the case late, was brought in late to try that case. Mm -hmm. And um, and so a lot of the evidence was what it was. But without a doubt, you know, you go back and look at things and wonder whether uh, you could have, should have examined somebody differently. And I mean, I, I think to answer your question directly, there's no question in my mind that you you learn more, I learn more from those times where it hasn't gone well than when everything is rolling and humming. It's fun when it's humming. It's really fun. It's why we do this. Yeah. But, um, but it's when it doesn't go so well and when it's a struggle to get through it that you have to go back and assess why did that happen? Was it a lack of preparation? Was it a lack of, was it a poor evaluation? Was it an underestimation of the witness, the opponent, the evidence, the strength of all of that? And uh, I think there has to be reflection that comes following every single trial. And frankly, that's whether you win or you lose. And even when you win, you've got to be honest in your assessment of things and realize that there is no perfect case. Now, I certainly have never tried one perfectly. And there are things that you can do differently. And I don't think you get better unless you make that effort to make a self-assessment every time you do it. Yeah, I think that's right. We need to make that assessment every case, win or lose. And uh, isn't the goal of being a good trial lawyer to always learn and always improve? There's no, you, you uh, optimally, everyone is a little better than the last one, you know? And, yeah. uh, and I think if you do it right, and if you, and if you do it, the way we're talking about it, where you're continuing to ass assess yourself and not be too proud to, you know, I say this and I'm going to say it in a facetious way, but shamelessly steal from people too. I mean, sure. I, I watch great lawyers every chance I get. And I, and I happen to be uh, blessed with having some real great ones here in our firm. And I've, I've been able to grow up with a lot of those lawyers. And yeah, you've got was, great lawyers in the firm. Oh, yeah. it was phenomenal. I mean, John Wingard is the guy that I learned from, and, and John was my mentor for a number of years, but Charlie Grebbing is here, and Alan Brubaker is here, and Steve yeah. Grebbing is here, and, you know, every chance I get, I watch them, and, and I'll steal stuff that they've done, and whether it's a phrase, the turning of a phrase, or the way to get into an issue, I think we all learn from watching others do it as well. Well, so now, stealing from people if it's good stuff and it fits your personality, that's great. But we also got to be careful because you could steal from somebody where they do something that doesn't fit your personality. What do you think about that? I, I totally agree. And I, and, and I have, you know, the experience of that in, in that when I was first starting here, one of the things that I was fortunate that every young lawyer here at Winger Grebbing was told is go out and watch everybody that you can. And, and to your point, I remember watching Charlie in a deposition or in a trial and Alan in a deposition. And, and I would come back and I would think, I can't do that. You know, I mean, I'm not, I'm not that way. And Alan has a very different personality and Charlie has a different personality and John did right. as well. And I didn't, I was none of them, you know, and and until you come to grips with what you just said, which is your style has to be your style. And so you take certain things from what you see other people do and blend them and, and make them work within your style. And some things you can't do. Some things are just not going to work for who it is that you are. Right. And so as much as they may work for somebody else, you may have to dispense with those because they're not true to who you are. Yeah, so I think the goal is steal liberally, but make sure it works for your personality. 100%. And, and by the way, I, I'm an equal opportunity stealer. Boy, I hope people know I'm kidding on this stuff. But <laughs> but I, I remember, Monty, that when I was when I was a brand new lawyer, and not even that brand new, I mean, I, I would attend every single uh, abode of masters in trial seminar that I could, and every one of the things that was put on by the, just the legends in our bar for years and years. And I still have, I'm sure I could pull them out here. I still have my notes from going to those seminars 30 years ago. Yeah. And, and I can remember using the, the introductory way that Craig McClellan 
got into examining experts and I yep. heard it back then. And I thought, you know what, this is a great way to do this. And frankly, the guys in our office were not necessarily doing it. Um, didn't mean they were good or bad, but I just heard Craig do it. And I thought this is wonderful. So I started using that. So I, I you know, I think that we have a, a great deal. We have more resources than we know to learn great habits here. Yeah, we really do from everybody. Now, one other thing before we go off this topic, um, and I like your perspective. One of the things that I learned, and I started off doing defense work like you, but then did more plants work for many years. And I can remember losing a trial years ago. It was a plants med mal trial. And I was really dejected, really disappointed, you know, just like you were talking about. Sure. Uh, and what I didn't realize at the time is that actually was really good for me because I tried it against a local legend in San Diego, well-respected, great trial lawyer. And because I tried it and because he knew I was prepared and because he knew I was going to be ready and I wasn't afraid to try cases, all of a sudden in the future, things were different. Yep. And the fact that I tried and lost actually paid dividends over time. Can you think of any dividends from a loss on either plan for defense side in addition to that that you've learned? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, I, and I was telling this story to somebody not that long ago. So I, I think I've had one time and one time only in my 35 years of doing this where I probably was at risk of getting a little full of myself. I had tried a case. Uh, it was actually right after my son was born, and it was a it was a really difficult case, and I worked hard on that case, and and uh, wound up getting what was a really good verdict in the case. And I think for for about a week, I thought, you know, I think I might really know what I'm doing. And then I remember, I went shortly thereafter. I, I fortunately the next my experience was not in front of a jury, but it was a it was a large binding arbitration that I remember I had within say a few weeks of completing that trial. And I mean, I thought I was the man. And and I went in. And it was about a three-day arbitration. And as I said before, I, I do a self-assessment and always have. And I mean, I got beat at every phase of that arbitration. And it was by a lawyer that I had never heard of. I never knew, you know, I, unlike what you're saying about trying to case against a legendary lawyer, I, I didn't know this person at all. And, and he was kicking my behind every single day. And somehow magically, I came out with an award that was pretty good that in reality, I probably didn't deserve because I really, if I'm assessing myself, I got beat every single day. And what that case taught me, not that I needed uh, a dose of humility because I'm not typically one that is uh, long on arrogance anyway, but, I, but what that case taught me is that it doesn't matter who your opponent is and whether you've heard of them or whether you think you know about them, they can beat you any day of the week. And so preparation is absolutely supreme and king every single time you do this. Yeah, I think you have to assume with any opposing counsel, whether you know them, whether you've never heard of them, that they're going to try the case the very best way they can, and you need to prepare for that. No doubt. No doubt. Yeah. Well, let's talk a little bit about preparation. I mean, I don't know what it's like for you. Obviously, if you have a last minute case you jump into, it's different. But if you've handled a case and you're getting ready for trial, whether it's in the last month or the last few months, do you have a kind of a routine you've developed and, and what's your process for really getting ready to go down and try that case? Well, I, I have, I do have a routine and it has been developed over time and, and uh, maybe much to my family's chagrin, it involves the same things and have for probably the last 10 years. And it is 1000% immersion in that case. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, I, I would uh, have to say that in the last few weeks, at least before I'm trying a case of any significance, I'm probably not the greatest lawyer to have for the rest of my clients because my returning of phone calls becomes relatively sporadic. My returning of emails becomes relatively sporadic. It's not because I don't care, but it's because I truly in that final stage, the only thing that I can focus on is that case. And, right. um, what I've done is even on cases, I live up in Carlsbad and cases that we, I, I try locally here, even in San Diego, I get the same little hotel that I stay in 
uh, right close to our office so that I can waste absolutely no time traveling back and forth. And it truly does involve absolute total immersion and everything so that by the time that I walk in, every, every detail that needs to be known about that case is something that I can be conversant in. I don't need to look at a piece of paper to know details or dates or if it's an injury case, when certain things happened and what certain people said. It's, it's got to be known well enough to be fluid. And uh, so that, that's what the last few weeks of any case are going to look like for me. Yeah, and and I think you probably have the same feeling. My feeling always in trying to get prepared, same goal. I want to really know everything, be totally prepared. But the fear is, have I prepared enough? And Am you I never feel like enough? you do. You never ever. I mean, I, it's funny because every time you get ready, you know, let's say, and we've all had this, you're ready to go. You go down there and suddenly you're going to trail for whatever the reason. And right. And you're ready, but you then use all of the rest of that time to continue to prepare. And, I, and I've been envious of people who, you know, <laughs> they get that time and they go off and they do something else. They work on another case or they take depositions or they go, I can't do that. I mean, that's for me, that's why I hate being on the wheel, because yeah. whatever additional time I have, I can do nothing else other than continue to work on that. case. <laughs> that's true. You got to keep working on that. But th but then if you're properly prepared once the trial starts that's the fun because now you're in the flow and all you can do is be reacting and doing what you got to do in the midst of that trial right i think that's right and i think that that's what what you said is so true that you being able to react and being in the flow is everything and you know, the I think, as I'm sure we'll talk about as we get deeper into kind of the nuances of uh, of a trial, but so much of trying cases is listening, observing and reacting. Yeah. And you can't do any of that if your head is buried in a in an outline. And I'm not saying you don't prepare outlines. I, I prepare every single thing that I'm ever going to do in the courtroom before I do it. There's no question about that. But yeah. but you've got to know it well enough that you're not wedded to it and you're not locked into it so that you know there are times where a witness may respond in a way with a facial expression that will lead to cross-examination or with a a gesture that will lead to cross-examination or a body movement or what or a pause or something that you have to be fluid enough to be able to recognize and you can only do that if your preparation is where it needs to be well let's talk about that because we brought it up you've prepared and so now one of the key things you need to do is really be an active listener and then follow what you're hearing or seeing, right? So talk about that some more. Yeah, I, you know, it's funny. I, I was watching uh, the, the podcast you had with, I think with Doug DeGrave was talking about this, uh, that the ability, or maybe it was Steve Quattlebaum, but the ability to go in whatever direction the witness thinks they want to go um, is is really critical. Now, that doesn't mean that you don't make the effort to control examination. I'm just giving this as one example. But, right. you know, it, one of the reasons that it becomes problematic is you see a lot of young lawyers or new lawyers or maybe inexperienced lawyers, and they have appropriately so they've prepared an outline of where they want their examination to go. But heaven forbid somebody gives them an answer that's going to take them to page four of the outline before they get there. And they either have to dump the answer because they're not yet on page four or they go there and now everything is, you know, has, has gone haywire on them. And so I think that being prepared enough and knowing the material and the witness and where you need to go well enough that you can say wherever you want to go, we'll go there. We'll come back to where I'm going to be, but I know if you answer this way, I know what I need to cover with you. So we can do it now or we can do it later. And yeah. that only occurs if your preparation is at the, the highest level and you know exactly where your sort of pathways are throughout the course of your examination and where you want to go. Yeah. And when you're that prepared and you're actively listening, you'll hear something and maybe they're saying something you didn't even expect to hear, but you can follow up on that and just go down that path, however long it takes you, right? Well, and it, exactly. And I think that 
again, this goes back to in, in terms of your preparation, if you're prepared well enough and you do hear an answer that um, may not be directly relevant to or related to something that you know exists, and maybe it's not even with that witness. Maybe right. it's with another witness, but you know that the testimony that you just heard is going to benefit you in a great way with another witness. You've got to know the material, not only for that witness, but for the others well enough right. to be able to exploit that at that time. It's, it's one of the reasons that, you know, I, th I think a lot of um, trial lawyers will talk uh, about how, well, you know, it's a long case, so I still have time to learn what's going on. And they do it, I think, in an effort to sort of come across looking well. But I, I believe, and I've always done it this way, is you've got to be ready to go for every single witness before that case ever starts, for the reason that we just said. If you're still having yeah. to worry about what you're going to cross Mr. Jones about, then maybe that nugget that you get from the expert that might have helped you if you knew where you were going with Mr. Jones is going to fall flat. Uh, but if you know what your overall theme and strategy is for everybody else, you're going to be able to exploit those that much better. I've never been one of those people like uh, people who went before me and before you who could say, hey, I'm going to learn the case while we're in trial. I always have felt I really have to be prepared and be ready to go when it starts. And Absolutely I think it makes agree. a big difference. Totally, completely agree. I, I, uh, I, I envy those that are that may be smart enough to be able to truly do it. I think we have to separate out those who really do it versus those that say they do. Yeah. But, I, but I envy those who have the gray matter to be able to do it. I'm not one of them. Yeah, that's true. Well, let's talk a little bit when you've got a case and most of the time you're on the defense side. And so maybe we'll talk about that. But if you want to mention plaintiff stuff, that's great. What are some of the successful trial themes that you've used in your different jury trials? Well, you know, I would say that the, the themes I use are fairly consistent with some tweaking from case to case. Yeah. I think that in almost, every, well, not almost, every case is ultimately centered around credibility. And it has to start with mine. Um, you know, I recognize in every single case, if I am in any way subject to somebody claiming that something I've said is inaccurate or I've stated something wrong or, or falsely, or I've tried to mislead somebody, which I never have, never will. And I don't think I've really ever been accused of that by anybody as, as hard as trials get. But your credibility is number one. So every theme that I have is built upon primarily my credibility as the mouthpiece for my client and ultimately, hopefully, my client's credibility as well. And then usually on the defense side of cases, um, especially if, let's say, there's a the, the liability side of the case is, is maybe not one that's uh, hotly disputed. And I would have to say a lot of the cases that I have these days are in that category because... Uh, you, you're usually talking about damages being the driving force on a lot of these cases. On the defense side, my main theme that I almost always go back to is that the jury needs to be focused on compensation versus reward. Uh -huh. um, and so using the jury instruction that speaks to reasonable compensation and trying to make sure as often as I can and as consistently as I can that the jury is focused on the goal of the system. And not just because it's me saying it, but because the jury instructions that will help guide them as to making their verdict will talk about the need to engage in, in discussion so that reasonable compensation can be achieved. And that's a far cry from, um, again, reward. And oftentimes it's a nice way to immediately address these sometimes crazy numbers that you hear from the other side that are not necessarily tied to anything tangible. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So let's go to this, this next question. And this is always fun because everybody's got different views. So you've tried a lot of cases, defense and plaintiff side. What do you think in your experience is the most important part of a jury trial? For me personally, I think that it's funny. The part that I think is the most important is the part that I'm most uncomfortable with, even to this day, 35 years into doing it, and that's jury selection. Mm, um, yeah. I think I think who it is that hears your case is 
going to dictate the outcome more often than anything else. And I, you know, I've tried a lot of cases against a lot of lawyers who have really great reputations. And then you get in and you see them and you think, you know, it's nothing that's wowing me in terms of their um, their minute to minute presentation. But I think that they're trying cases to the right group of people. And uh, what I've found is if you have the right jury that's listening to your case, uh, you can try less than your best case and still get a very good outcome. But the converse is rarely true. You can try the best case you could ever try and try it to the wrong group of people for that case. And your chance for success goes down dramatically. So when you're picking your jury in voir dire, um, what are you trying to accomplish and what kinds of people are you trying to get to keep on that panel and what kind of people are you trying to get off that panel? Well, you know, it's interesting. I think about the difference in, I think trying cases now versus when I started is different across the board, you know, right. in comparing the way that I first started versus the way that is commonplace now, it's, it's almost like night and day. And jury selection is probably one of the areas where the change has been the most profound, in my opinion. You know, when I started, it was all about um, make sure that you don't get crushed with somebody saying something in jury selection that that's really going to hurt you. So you asked a lot of closed questions in yeah. jury selection. Would yeah. you be fair and impartial? Can you be fair and impartial? Can you keep <laughs> that evidence aside? Can you listen to the evidence until every and and, you know, afraid of what might be the real answer? And now it's exactly the opposite. Now it's engaging in discussion and open discussion so that you can find out what's really going on. So for me, in terms of jury selection, some of the things that used to apply all the time, you know, the uh, if you're on the defense side, you stay away from teachers and you stay away from social workers and you get engineers and military people. And that's what you get your jury and you go home. You know, that was the old uh, school. Yeah, that was it. That was it. And, and uh, God forbid you ever picked anybody on the opposite side. Um, but I think it, it is, uh, very case dependent, you know, but I think the big overarching thing for me is, um, knowing what kind of juror I think might be helpful for me trying to identify, and all of this is guesswork, which is why I say it's, I think it's really hard. And I don't know that I'm particularly good at it, even after doing it for this many years, but trying to identify those people that are probably, the leaders and decision makers is as important as anything else because right. with only six peremptories and you know oftentimes you know you're you're going to question from 36 48 people right. and it, it's a fiction to think that you're really going to have the ability to know these people you're going to get what you can from them especially if a, if a judge is going to give you some limited time to engage in your voir dire um I think being able to pick or try to identify the leaders and try to make sure that those are people that seem to be receptive to your theme is is what I look for. Do you uh, use jury consultants very often? And if so, do you use um, certain kinds of cases? Tell us about that. Yeah, I, I have and I do. Um, I, although I will say that I use them um, less in the courtroom. I, I like to use them in getting ready for jury selection and identifying themes and identifying uh, areas of examination of various uh, prospective jurors. Uh, I don't use them as much in the courtroom as, you know, sometimes I think it would be nice, but I also know that for me, again, uh, jury selection is, it is the hardest part of the case because number one, it's your very, other than many openings, it's your first opportunity to really address the jury. Right. And it is an opportunity that comes only once. And so you don't want to look like you don't know what you're doing. You don't want to be fumbling around. You don't want right. to be doing, and, and I think it is the truest and rawest test of intelligence that we face during the course of a trial. When you think about under tremendous pressure, the, the quantity of information that you have to process in a very short period of time and make decisions while still keeping in mind what the evidence code says you can do and not do and what your opponent can do and not do, um, there's a lot going on. So having a jury consultant there with me 
uh, while helpful, uh, sometimes is a bit of a distraction for me. Yeah, that can be a distraction. Now, do you like to use focus groups to get ready for trying to pick your jurors and also work on themes or bad facts and things like that? I do. I, I um, you know, we've used both uh, mock juries here and also focus groups. And, and yeah. I would create a third hybrid category, which is what I use more than ever. And that's or more than both of those. And that's sort of my mini focus group, which is uh, my family, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, yeah. my, my family is my best focus group and has been my main focus group for probably the last 10 years. And uh, what I like about that is they, first of all, know that I, I don't want to hear that I'm good. I don't want to hear that, gosh, you were so, what, what I want to know is where is it that I'm going to fall apart on this? And is it yeah. boring? And is it repetitive? And whatever. And so um, I, I think it's really important before we get in there and try cases to run it by somebody who's going to give you an honest assessment. Sometimes that the best source of that is, a jury consultant, I'm sorry, is a, is a mock jury. Uh, yeah. I think the danger with those that I've heard others talk about is that sometimes we get too wedded to what we get as a result from a mock jury. And I don't think you can, you can do that because, no. you know, it, it's not going to model who's going to listen to your case. Focus groups are great um, uh, where you're going to get feedback and you're going to get some information, but all of it has to be used and not relied upon uh, you know, it, to a rigid degree, I think. Yeah, well, focus groups are great, but you you bring up a point that we need to repeat, which is good trial lawyers for the entire time I've been trying cases will should be talking to other people, real people, whether it's family members, whether it's friends, whether it's other people they know who are not lawyers and just be talking about their case and get reactions because that's like your own little focus group. There's no doubt. And, and I mean, every single lawyer in our firm becomes part of my focus group when I'm getting ready for a trial. Yeah. And, I, and I will run pieces of an argument, you know, an examination, whatever, by people. And sometimes there, there are people that have some affiliation with the case. Oftentimes, I want them to have no affiliation with the case. Yeah. So that I know what that reaction would be and whether there's any sort of a uh, an immediate visceral reaction that I might need to, to uh, use to revise what it is that I plan to do. So when you're when you're in that voir dire process, that important stage of the trial, how have many openings been either helpful or if you think they're not helpful, but how have they impacted the way you get to pick your juries? I love them. I, I think, you know, I, I might be uh, Although I don't know, I, I, a couple of years ago, I think I would have said that I might be in the minority among defense lawyers who I had heard were not terribly fond of many openings. I, I love them. Uh, I've liked them from the time we first started doing them. Um, maybe it's because of my insecurity in terms of my jury selection that I like the opportunity to be able to get up and talk a little bit with the jury before uh, I'm going to actually engage in the voir dire process because I'm far more comfortable and confident in terms of getting up and, and either giving an opening or a final argument than I ever would be in, in picking a jury. But I think they're great for shaping what the case is all about. I think they're great for introducing some of the key concepts that you are then going to be asking the jurors about during the course of voir dire. So I, I think they're fantastic. I think they're great as long as they're not abused. I think lawyers have to know what it is that the purpose of the mini opening is. Um, but I, but when used correctly, I think they're fantastic. So your strategy, and the judge may give you two minutes, three minutes, four minutes, whatever it is, but your strategy, what are you talking about? What kinds of things are you telling them about so you know what their reaction is? It's got to be non-argumentative, first of all. I think the right. worst mistake you could make is getting objected to in a mini opening. I mean, that you talk about setting, getting off on the wrong foot, that's a problem. So it's got to be a non-argumentative identification of what are truly the key issues in the case. And so uh, I, I would not start with, this is a case about, you know, Jimmy, when he was uh, six years old, he went to grade school here. I mean, you got three minutes, so you've got to get to right. what are the key issues right. and, and knowing what those are. And I think being straight up with the jury and saying, this case is going to be primarily about the issue of causation relating to whether or not Mr. Jones 
neck surgery is because of this accident. And so right. you're going to hear some competing evidence from the different doctors. I'd ask you to listen to both of those, whatever it might be. But I think getting to those and, and being direct in terms of what you're then likely going to be inquiring about uh, primarily during your jury selection. Yeah. And in the in the just a few minutes for a mini opening, are you talking about any bad facts on your side of the case? I, I absolutely am every time that, I mean, if they're bad facts that I think are going to move the needle, yes, every case has bad facts. And so right. I won't go out of my way to find them if I don't think that they're going to be material to the outcome. But if I know that there are bad facts that the other side is going to prey upon, and it may in fact be part of the opposing theme, there's, I absolutely believe it's important to get those out early. And it goes back to what we've talked about now a couple of times, and that's credibility. I think that the lawyer needs to be able to do that to make sure that their credibility is maintained. Um, if there's any sense at all that the lawyer is afraid of facts or is unaware of them or is trying to, uh, in an unreasonable way, try to reframe those, um, I think that the lawyer suffers. So yeah, the earlier the better in dealing with those material bad facts. Yeah, you don't want the jury thinking you're trying to hide <laughs> bad oh, facts the, the worst yeah the worst yeah you don't want that so in terms of uh, once you've picked the jury uh and let's let's talk a little bit about before we go to opening statement you've picked the jury you got the jury there now you may have spotted some issues in the case and you've already had some motions to eliminate and the judge has already decided all that but do you ever ever having you ever have anything kind of in your hip pocket where in case an issue comes up, you're ready to go with some short little brief and tell us about that if you do it? Yeah, I, I have. Um, and, and I've done it um, oftentimes with respect to and you, sometimes you can you can gauge this from voir dire, oftentimes from opening. But, you know, usually it's uh, even after motions and lemonade where arguably the court has already decided the controversial evidence as to whether it's going to come in or not. But sometimes there's more nuanced issues uh, right. where it's the, the manner in which, for example, a certain witness may be examined. And uh, and so for one area where I could thought about this is with experts, for example, um, you know, experts who have testified frequently are going to have other cases in which they've testified. And oftentimes the lawyers will have that evidence, that testimony and or reports or what have you. Right. And so being able to address that with the court to make sure that you know, so that you're prepared and your expert is prepared, what exactly is the scope of what is going to be addressed with this expert? And my experience is that judges are going to differ on that. You know, yeah. there are going to be some judges who say, we are not going to try multiple cases. And if, uh, you know, Dr. Jones has testified to an opinion in a case two years ago, we're going to need to know all the facts of that case to know whether that opinion is one that has merit or whether that opinion is one that is subject to cross-examination. But knowing that before the expert is going to testify is important. So I will oftentimes have a bench brief or a pocket brief ready to go before that expert's going to testify so that we know what we're not going to be surprised during the course of that examination when it goes in an area and then you're left doing what I hate to do, which is you're, you know, you're up like a jumping jack objecting, which I try not to do in virtually every case. Right. So that's a good strategy where you'll just bring that issue up to the judge before that witness comes in. You could maybe take a break, go back in chambers or in the hallway and you're ready to go. Um, I found that when you have pocket briefs or whatever you'd like to call them on an issue, let's say an evidentiary issue that you think could come up. It's very persuasive to the judge. If you've thought about it beforehand and you've analyzed the issue and you have a one or two page brief that you're ready to hand them, that really makes an impression and helps you win that argument. Have you ever found that to be the case? I, I do. And I think that, you know, being able to gift the court with the, the basis for ruling in your favor is what is important and yeah. uh, making sure that as a result, the law that's relevant to the point that you're citing is is easily understood and cited so that the court can adopt it and and use it in forming whatever ruling it is that you're hoping the court would provide. I think the 
the only risk and the thing that I'm always aware of and try to stay away from is you never want to make it look like you are waiting, you know, laying in wait to do this at a surprise last minute opportunity where the judge may not be terribly appreciative of the last minute nature of what it is that you're doing. But, right. but short of that, I agree with you that having something in writing, as opposed to simply standing up and as the court will inevitably do before you start your day, any issues that we need to take up outside the presence of the jury. And if you pop up and, and start spouting off some authority to advance whatever point you're trying to make, the likelihood of the court adopting it, especially if it's a significant issue, is probably relatively remote. Yeah, I agree with that. And, and you could say the same thing verbally that you say in that one page brief, but the fact that you've prepared it ahead of time, you thought about it, you've analyzed it, you've got something to give the judge that they can read and look up if they need to, that really makes a positive impression on the judge. Totally agree with you, totally yeah. agree. Okay, so now we've got our jury and uh, we're going forward to the trial. What's your strategy and what's your approach when you're giving your opening statement in your cases? Well, I think people like stories. That's my own personal belief. And so it's my approach has changed over time a little bit. Uh, again, cases were tried differently back when I first started and there was a greater acceptance, it seemed like, of almost just a recitation of evidence. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, I think about it, in fact, I was telling John Wingard about this last year, we were talking about trying cases and, and, uh, you know, John was as good a trial lawyer as I had seen when I first started, but John's approach when I started was like most people, and that was he took his binder up to the podium, and he stood behind the podium, and he used his outline, and he delivered what was often and almost always a really powerful uh, either opening, final argument, examination of a witness, but uh, I told him it just doesn't work that way anymore, and right. um, at least I, not in my experience, and so I, I try to tell a story in every case, and you know, the story may be framed differently depending upon what the facts are. But I think, you know, we've always heard that that it's difficult to capture jury's attention. Uh, and I think that that's true. But I think it, it is and it isn't true because, you know, people sit through movies and they're perfectly captivated if it's an interesting movie. It's and, a good story. And, and it's a good story. And so I think there's a tremendous amount of effort that needs to be invested into making sure you have a story that is uh, coherent and logical and concise, but that takes into account what your case and your themes are all about. But, but I try to do that and tell it as a story. Uh, again, not the old way of this is a roadmap, this is a preview of coming attractions. Uh, those days, at least for me, are largely over. Yeah, those days are gone. Now, in terms of modern trial, how much do you use computer graphics and other things to tell your story in opening statement? I use them a lot, and, I, and I've used them with increasing uh, frequency over the last probably 15 years. Uh, you know, and, and you'll remember this, that there was a time early on, uh, certainly in my time doing this, where there was a real concern on the defense side to doing that because you didn't want to look too glitzy, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the concern was that if you had too much fancy <laughs> stuff going on, that somebody would start to wonder, and maybe your client has a lot of money and maybe they're going to be willing to hit you with a number because they think your client has money or something like that. <laughs> but, um, but now I think in the, in the world that we live in, it's essential to have uh, something for the jury to look at uh, I think if somebody is just standing there droning on, the risk of boredom is very high. Um, and, but giving the jury something to be able to look at and and hear as the you know as appropriate um, is important. Now I will say this though too is I think we can overwhelm in those things. I mean I I often have a very rudimentary PowerPoint type thing that I intentionally put together myself because I don't do them that well. But as a result of that, it's a fairly um, basic and simple thing that allows sort of my signposts to be there for the jury to see. Because I think, and I learned this a long time ago, the more we can um, take in with our senses what somebody is trying to, to uh, tell us, 
right. the greater the opportunity to learn it. And so if you can see it, hear it, smell it, feel it, taste it, all, those are great if you can get all of that, you know, but at least to be able to see it, hear it, um, those are those are good combinations to have. So I will virtually always have at least a PowerPoint photographs to the extent that they're relevant in whatever it is that we're talking about. And if there are uh, uh, video clips of depositions that we can use in opening, I think that's a perfect example as well. Yeah, in my experience, depo video clips can be very powerful in telling your story. No have doubt. you found that to be the case? No doubt. I mean, you've got the person's own words and, and especially the way that it works in the modern world. Again, I mean, you think about we all have gone down this road where you think, you know, you've got great impeachment from a witness 20 years ago uh, because you've got them saying something fantastic in a deposition. And then you're there in front of the jury and you're saying reading from the deposition at page 86, line two <laughs> question. Did you, and, you know, the jury's going. What is this all about? And it yeah. doesn't, it has nowhere near the effect that we as the lawyer who has engaged in that process thinks that it has. It's frankly pretty boring to a jury. And yeah. you can tell them all you want with a with a jury instruction that this is just like testimony that was given in a court of law. But when you're reading this very dry bit of testimony, it, it just doesn't come across like it does now when you're able to hit a button and you've got the video along with the testimony down below, it's, I think it's a very powerful, powerful piece of evidence in any case. Yeah, it's their own words. And once again, that may be going to their credibility. That's right. And you may be showing early on, there's some problems <laughs> with their credibility. That's right. No question. No question. Now, do you give shorter opening statements now than you did when you started out? I think it's case dependent. I mean, I, I, I am always concerned about going too long, yeah. always. Um, but I, I don't sacrifice um, content for brevity necessarily. I don't believe that it's right. absolutely essential to go, you know, rigidly no more than 20 minutes or what have you. I think there are cases where that's a good idea. But I think if you've got you know, if you're going to try a multi-week trial and you've got 15 experts who are going to testify and you've got uh, issues that are hotly contested across the board, again, that's the premium is then on the strength of the story and the and the uh, extent to which the story is easy to listen to. But I think in those situations, you're going to have to go a little bit longer. And I, I'm not afraid of that if I'm confident in the logic and the, the conciseness of the story overall. Okay. Now, we talked early on in our discussion today about the importance of active listening and really listening to what people are saying. Now, when you're doing direct examination, let's say you're talking to your client or you're talking to one of your experts or whatever, have you found that active listening can also be important in that discussion? I, I think, oddly, it's certainly equal to, if not more, than what you need in cross-examination. Yeah. Because, you know, you, your the, the difficulty, I think, with direct examination is, first of all, I think it is a very, very underrated, difficult part of a case. Um I think it people, is underrated and it is difficult. I agree. I think it's I think it's very hard because when you I mean, when you think about it, cross-examination is sort of the crown jewel of what we do other than right. opening and final argument. But, you know, it's also and I'm not saying it's ever easy, but the ability to lead it, we underrate how important that is, you yeah. know, and, and you can frankly testify. You don't even have to ask questions. You can testify through right. your cross-examination. <laughs> You can't do that with your direct examination. And if you have a client who may be um, one who is not good in front of people and everyone's going to be nervous in that environment. Yep. And and worst of all, if they happen to be unprepared, boy, nothing can can land flatter than a bad direct examination. So, yeah, being able to listen, being able to observe being able to see if your client is struggling as you're, as you're getting through that and being able to, in a gentle way, say, let me help you understand that. And, and certainly be, uh, take the, take the heat on that. If the client is having trouble, make sure that you can say, I see that you're struggling with that. My question wasn't a good one. Let me ask you another one and, and redirect it off of your client, take it on yourself right. so that your client's credibility can continue to be maintained. 
Yeah, that's I. You know, I think it's an art form to to have a good and interesting direct is very important, and it's tougher than people ever think about. Without a doubt. Without a doubt. <laughs> well, let's go to cross. So when you're cross-examining witness, let's talk about a couple of different things. Number one, you're listening actively for gems you may be able to follow down, like we talked about. But in your cross, do you tend to use a um, kind of an open-ended cross, which I would say is a Jerry Spence approach, or in San Diego, we'd say a Milt Silverman approach, maybe. Or do you use the more of the classic closed cross where you're controlling the witness, yes or no questions, that kind of stuff? I think the predominant cross for me is still a closed cross. Now it's yeah. it's kind of a modified closed cross, but it's but it is. And I think um I think certainly with witnesses that you know are good and savvy witnesses and have, right. have been around the block a lot of times. Uh I think it's dangerous to get too cutesy. And uh, it sounds good. I mean, I'd love to be able to tell you, Monty, that I, oh, no, I, you know, I never know the answer to any question. And I, I go with the flow. And I mean, then I would be a real warrior if I did that. But I don't do that. Um, I, I know where I'm going. I know what it is that the evidence is going to say or what the evidence is. And so I primarily will use a closed cross with certainly with witnesses that I view as being uh, either the really critical witnesses and really dangerous ones. Now, I will say with this caveat, I think that there are occasions where if you have a witness who you know is very, very likable um, and a witness where you know that there is going to be a perception of a disparity between the witness and you as the lawyer and right. recognizing that the jury is almost always going to side with or or have empathy for the witness versus the lawyer because they can picture themselves in the witness box they're not going to necessarily picture themselves doing what you're doing right. and so in those situations to the extent i can use a more open cross i will because i think it comes across as a little less heavy-handed and and especially with those witnesses where you don't want to come across that way it may be useful well that's good uh in terms of cross have you ever you know, when you're taught in law school, everybody's taught don't ask a question where you don't know the answer. But I've I've found that there are occasions where if you really prepare the case and you're thinking about that witness and that cross, you may come across something where you go, you know, I don't know the answer, but I feel pretty confident that whatever answer they give, it's not going to help them. It's only going to help us. So you ever do that? All the time. And I think that that, again, goes back to the issue of, of preparation, where there's a lot of times that I ask a question and I don't know the answer in as much as I don't know what the words will be that will come out of that witness's mouth. But to your point, I know the material well enough that I know whatever that answer is, I have a way to go. And it's, and it's a way that's going to be productive for me. So, and I, and I like to, to be able to cross examine that way because it really does. I think, first of all, it exudes a confidence. You know, I think that sometimes right. if you are cross is always closed, if you do the same thing every time and all you're eliciting are yeses and nos, while that's classically the way that cross-examination is done, it also can result in jurors wondering, well, give them a chance to, to answer some of these questions. Yeah. So I think the open cross provides that opportunity. And as long as you know where you're going to go and you know, regardless of what answer you're going to get, because you may not know that answer, but having that already planned out in your mind, at least, um, then I think it's very effective and I, and I would use it every chance I get. Can, can you sometimes ask too many questions across? <laughs> oh yeah. Uh, and, and you know, it's, it's funny. I think, um, my, what I've, and this is all, all of these are things that, you know, we learn from doing and, and I can think of many times where, um, I have prepared so hard for a given cross and I thought I was so ready that, um, you know, you, you're not listening, you fall victim to not necessarily listening and either you get ahead of yourself, uh, yeah. 
and you don't let it flow. You know, you don't you don't create or or let the questions breathe a little bit. You know, I learned a long time ago. In fact, I think it was in the first case that I tried, which was with you and and Charlie and and uh, Greg Kanoski. And yeah. I remember being really amazed watching how you guys would take a point, but. The point was not just simply the point that was made. It was the development of the questions before that point that really made it sing. And so, you know, I think that if you sometimes you launch too quickly into what it is that is your main point on cross-examination and you don't get the answer that you want, and then you're scrambling because you feel like I got to get that answer. Then you start asking a bunch of questions that you don't know the answer to and, and not in a good way. And yeah, it's uh, getting stung by that. Uh, again, I think we've all done it. It is not pleasant. <laughs> well, let's let's talk about uh, you're in your final argument stage. You've presented all the evidence. And it sounds like, and this makes sense to me, most of the time in your defense cases are, that are going to trial, you've either got a causation issue or you've got a how much are the damages issue and you've got wild different opinions about what the damages are so in your final argument as we all know the jury is not told in the jury instructions well here's how you calculate what the non-economic damages are so what do you do to give them something to help them figure out how to put numbers on this what's your approach I um, usually will will use the jury instructions as much as I can, as well as the verdict form in final argument, because I, yeah. I like to give the jury as much structure as possible, because I, I recognize that the, the task, which is totally new to them, and which comes inherently with very little structure, is then sometimes intimidating. So yeah. to give them as much guidance as possible, and to not have it be just me telling them, but rather this is what the jury instructions tell you to do. So I find every instruction that I can that that has the word reasonable in it. And and I will continue to then reemphasize and use that in saying this is the reason why I keep talking with you about why it's important to find to, you know to come up with reasonable compensation is because every, all of these points along the way where you will be guided by the instructions that the court will provide to you or may have already provided to you, they emphasize reasonable, reasonable compensation. And so um, the more we can do that, the more I can focus on that, I think the greater the opportunity to then talk about reasons why I, and if I've maintained my credibility throughout the course of the case, which hopefully has been uh, the case, then emphasis on the jury instructions focus on reasonableness and and my own credibility puts me gives me at least a chance to have them follow my lead on that okay and then when you're giving your final argument sometimes if you have a big liability issue you may spend most of the time on liability but when you talk about damages how do you frame it? Are you saying this is a suggestion? This is what I think would be reasonable under the circumstances. Are you giving them a number or a range? What are you doing? I it, obviously it's case dependent. I mean, if you have cases where you you believe that you are gonna or should win on liability, I, I've never been one that then bypasses damages entirely. I know that for a while people would do that. You know, there was a time where. Uh, people were gutsy enough that they wouldn't even talk about the damages. I, I can't imagine doing that. Maybe that's because the nature of the cases that I have, I, I would be I would be on the bottom of a V myself if I wound up doing that. So so I don't yeah. do that. Uh, but but um, depending on whether I think that the jury should find in my favor on liability or not, I may say I am confident that you know, this case will never get to damages. But on behalf of my client, I have an absolute obligation. This is my one chance to talk to all of you. And so recognizing that it's certainly within your prerogative and province to to disagree with me, I want to talk to you about the damages. And then I will yeah. get into that. Um, but again, with an emphasis on what is reasonable. And I typically will give a range. I don't give an exact number. I give a range and I give a reason for the range too. Um, I don't simply come up with a figure off the top of my head and say, this number sounds good, I, especially if it's, let's say it's a heavily non-economic case, um, then I will hopefully have a lot of information about how the person's life has remained relatively good 
over the course of time and be able to use that as a springboard for saying th because they still they like to you know ski surf run play tennis they still do that they, they you know mr jones indicates he doesn't do it quite as often but his doctors have indicated it's going to happen in the future and therefore what is reasonable compensation for somebody who continues to do these things it might be x um so but i, I think i like to have the goods on what they're still able to do and then i typically give a range okay and um uh, you know on the plaintiff side uh, the plaintiffs are probably typically asking for numbers that are much higher than you're going to talk about in final argument. And I, I, I've always thought, and I've done a lot of plaintiffs trials that on the plaintiff side, while you want to try to get a fair amount, I don't, I think you always got to worry about, are you asking for too much? Is there a similar corollary on the defense side? If you're on the defense side, making an argument, do you ever worry about, am I giving a range that they'll think is too low? Absolutely, hundred percent, and and I think, you know, this this gets to be a little bit uh, more nuanced. But I will tell you, one of the real concerns is I have a lot of cases where there are, you know, alleged blown policy limits uh, situations where you may have a client that has a modest amount of insurance, and uh, and so it's the whole reason you're trying to case is because you can't get it settled after a demand has been made and not accepted, and in those situations where now you're now you're in a difficult position because you're going to try that case and exactly for the reason that you indicated you know standing up after you've done all you can all through the trial to make sure that your credibility is maintained and that you have come across as reasonable throughout the entirety of the case but then standing up and giving a number that is so utterly ridiculous um, I, I absolutely have fear and I think it can backfire exactly the same way uh, I definitely believe that there are there are some cases that I have done well in because the, the lawyer on the plaintiff side has overshot and they have turned people off as a result of the, the number that was argued. Um, but I probably haven't done as well on some cases because of that same issue where I felt like my hands were tied and I didn't have the ability to give the number that I might think was really the true number. But but you've got certain artificial constraints that may be in place that dictate that. Yeah, I think that risk on the dollars being asked for works both ways. 100%. For both plaintiff and defense, it's 100%. a risk factor. Well, Bob, this has been a wonderful conversation. And just like I knew it would, it's gone way too fast. Absolutely. And it's been a lot of fun. But I want to finish off with this one question. You've been practicing for a number of years, and as we've talked about before we started this interview, that we can learn as experienced trial lawyers, but young people uh, who want to try cases can certainly learn from others. What advice would you give to young people who want to try to become trial lawyers? Maybe it's advice you got from your colleagues at your firm when you started. Maybe it's something you've learned along the way. What advice would you give to younger lawyers or less experienced trial lawyers who really want to become better at being a good trial lawyer? I would say three things, and, and one of them may not be controllable. I would say do it as much as you can. And that one is the one that you can't really control. Unfortunately, in the modern age, there are fewer and fewer opportunities for young lawyers or relatively inexperienced lawyers to get into trial. But every opportunity that you have I think you ought to do it. There's no there's no substitute for that. Number two is observe. As I mentioned before, you know, go watch people who know what they're doing. And it's easy enough to learn of lawyers who are in trial. Go watch them because you're going to learn a ton. And number three, I think, is read. Read as much as you can. And and I would say, I mean, I, I have certain books that I have read multiple times and I reread them multiple times. Uh, there's a book called The Man to See about Edward Bennett Williams. It's a biography about Edward Bennett Williams, and it's probably the best book I've ever read. But it's a it just profiles him as a trial lawyer, the way that he went about trying cases and the and again, the intense preparation that he would uh, put into every single case. There's another book called The Trial Lawyers by Emily Couric, and it profiles a bunch of really famous trial lawyers um, and their approach in the way that they do things. Um, there's another book called uh, The Trial Lawyer, What It Takes to Win by David Berg. 
and it talks about various strategies and ways to get in and out of issues. Um, and, and I think that those, and there's a ton of others I could go over, but, but the reality is being able to read from uh, or read about lawyers who have done it at the level that I think we all would aspire to do it and seeing how they do it in a little bit of a nuanced, different way, but, but all at the core working as hard as they can possibly work on behalf of their clients, um, it helps. It, it really helps. Well, that's great. And we also have in this modern world, the opportunity where there may be, you know, video conversations or presentations where you can hear great trial lawyers talk about different things and how they try cases or different approaches to things. And I, I think your suggestions are great. I can remember the first 10 or more years I was a lawyer. The only thing I read was stuff dealing with direct cross evidence, learn how to be a better trial lawyer, and you got to keep learning your whole life. So Absolutely. I agree with you. hundred percent. Well, Bob, thanks so much for being a great guest today. Thanks for all the good work that you do in the world. And uh, thanks for your zealous representation of your clients with credibility and with uh, the fact that your word is your bond. And uh, thank you for sharing your knowledge with us today. It's been my pleasure. Really enjoyed it, Monty. Okay.